I'm going to get started here. We are in James, and we're still in chapter one. And uh, last time we kind of got right up to about verse 17. Uh, so I'm going to do a quick little review, and uh, let's move and get right back in. But let's do a quick listen so we can kind of refresh ourselves on what this first chapter is all about. James 1. The general epistle of James, chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, the greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let the brother of low degree rejoice in that he is exalted, but the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass, and the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perisheth. So also shall the rich man fade away in his ways. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness, and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. All right. So... Here we go with James. <laughs> yeah. Well, James is. Uh, I think he. He. I think one of the reasons why he has to be so blunt is that he's talking to people that are already being persecuted. This is shortly after Stephen's had been stoned, and uh, there is a rebellion. Not so much a rebellion, but there is a. Uh, a, a an anger towards these uh, these people that are so-called in the way, is what they call them, that are following the way, which was the way of Jesus. And the um, the established religious community is persecuted. Now, they also are beginning to get pressure from Rome. So they're getting hit by the, the established religious community, and they're also getting hit by the government. So uh, they're being moved, they're being scattered, they're going back and forth. And what you see is that uh, James is telling them, we don't, you know, you guys are going through, you guys are, good morning, you guys are having some difficulty, but uh, that's just all part of it. Now let me tell you why you're going through some stuff. We're in James chapter 1. While you're going through some stuff, what you're going to have to deal with. 
Because see, when you go through things, when, when, when hard times hit and difficulties happen and the unfortunate and unexpected happen, you, your mind begins to think. And the devil is quick to start throwing ideas in there. To start, to, to, you know, God must don't care for you. God don't. He's, all that stuff just gets thrown because you're wondering. You know, uh, you look at Sarah and Abraham when they were going through their, their little struggle. And God had told him, you are going to have a child. And uh, God told Abraham, it's going to come from your loins. Mm -hmm. And Sarah and Abraham, they sat there together and they thought. And then Sarah said, well, I got another idea. And yeah. she laughed. Well, she laughed after the angel said they were going to have a child. But she came up with her own scheme. I, God must mean this. And so you start philosophizing, you start theorizing, you start thinking up stuff and, um, and different things. My wife is making me laugh because <laughs> we would talk about this. And I said, you know, that, and, I, and I pointed out a point. You know, I'm just going to say it so I can get it out to get it out the way. The first two times in the Bible that the wife gave a suggestion to the husband it was pretty bad. That when Eve gave told to Adam, take and eat. Mm -hmm. And then when Sarah told, told Abraham, go take my maid Hagar. Mm -hmm. and so I said, well, you know, that first two times wasn't that good. I said, but the rest of it, they kind of fixed it up. And so she was like, where you get that from? <laughs> I said, it was that Bible. <laughs> So, you saying your point being my point being is I'm moving on back. I'm going back to James. The thing is, let's continue. The thing is, we got it right. You guys are coming along. We're coming along, okay. We're still coming along. Mm -hmm. Well, and then I told her, I said, Well, see, I do have to put the blame back on Adam and back on yeah. I'm back on uh, uh, Abraham right. because, because they should have did like Job did because see when Job's wife came out with her suggestion <laughs> when Job was going through and, and Job's wife said why don't you curse God and die and what did Job say you sound like one of them foolish women so now what, eight, what Adam should have said was, I ain't, Adam should have said, I ain't eating this apple. You sound like, you sound like a foolish woman. And what, what Abraham should have said, I ain't taking that woman as to be my second wife. You sound like one of them foolish women with that idea. So they didn't stand up either. The men just kind of backed down, didn't do nothing. And you know what doing nothing means. Remember the guy that buried his talent in the ground? I'm not going to do nothing, I'm just going to bury it. What did God call him? A fool. He called him unfaithful and unprofitable and, and wicked servant. So, gentlemen. Okay. So, see, I couldn't, I couldn't let that, because she was giggling at me. <laughs> she was giggling at me because we were talking about that last, we were talking about that last night while we were doing food shopping. So I was like, okay. <laughs> so you put something in the basket and she took it out? Foolish woman. Twinkies looking good. You know what? That's one of those subjects I think I'm on. <laughs> That's right. We're going to go back to James now. We're going to let James talk. But I wasn't going to go there. But it just happened. I was talking about. But, but then when I. Soon as I mentioned Abraham and Sarah, which I was going to bring up a different point. She started giggling at me. I said, okay, she think I'm going that way. Now, and I can't contain myself. But anyway, let's get back to James. So they're going through these difficulties. And James is letting them know, all right, that you got you to gotta hang in there. It may look good. I mean, it may not look good. It may look bad. And the point I was making with Abraham and Sarah was that it didn't look good after God had already told them they were going to have a child. But now they're up in age. They're getting up in the, in, in the 90s. You know, and they and they're wondering, well, what's going to happen? But this is the the aspect of being able to trust God. God will not let you down. He won't tempt you above what that you are able to. You just gotta hold on and and allow Him to 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 let His perfect work happen. And so we as individuals, and this is what James is trying to point out, we are easily bombarded with cross ideas, like how Sarah. And, and, and Abraham had a cross idea. Different things will come in, and they all come in by the enemy. 
It's the same thing with Eve. Eve didn't think of this whole stuff by herself. What happened? The, the serpent came in. The devil came in through ideas in her head. You see? And those are the things we have to keep in mind. You get these ideas thrown in because things are not going the way you kind of thought they were going to happen. And so look at what James says. And we kind of touched on this already. I'm just going to go through these first 16 verses and then pick up where we left off on verse 17. But James has said that he's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we know that he is uh, being very humble in this aspect because he is also the natural half-brother of Jesus. Okay? Um, uh, he was born to, um, to Mary and to, uh, to uh, Joseph. Joseph is Joseph? Joseph. And um, whereas Jesus was uh, conceived um, through Mary through the Immaculate Conception. All right. So um, he says, my brother encountered all what joy when you will fall into divers temptations. Because see, the, 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 the joy of the Lord is your what? Strength. Then you're going to be able to stand strong in the things of the Lord. I'm happy that I know Jesus even though I'm going through difficulties. So he said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations because that joy keeps the devil out. The devil works in frustration. He works in anger. He works in, in, in just being teed off. And, and when you allow yourself to get like that, the devil can get in and can then begin to do his stuff. And we're going to see here at the end where, where James talks about wrath and how it's not, it's not good. But um, if you can keep uh, a joyous, it, is, it didn't say use the word happy. It ain't saying that you got to be walking around grinning and smiling, but you got to have the joy of the Lord mm -hmm. in the midst of your temptation. I ain't worried about this because this may be an issue. This person may not be doing this right and this way, but that ain't got nothing to do with what God can do. God, God got all this. God is not surprised by any of these actions. God knows about it. He understood it. He saw it coming before it happened. All right. So then why am I going to get upset? Because see, if there's anybody that got the right to get upset, is God. That's why God said, vengeance is what? Mine. All right, so we got to let that, we got to learn, and that's why I, I'm, I'm throwing that word out there. We got to learn, because it ain't always easy to do. All right? You got to be able to just say, you know what? God is not confused right now. I may be confused. I may, and these people that were being tried, they were being put to death. Stephen was stoned. But what did Stephen do when he was being stoned? He, he, he exemplified joy. While he, those rocks were hitting him and he was dying, he, he said, I see the heavens open and I see uh, the, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of the Father. So he was able to, but yet at the same time, he got stoned to death. But he kept his joy of the Lord. Real significant aspect about our Christian experience. That's what we got to get to. That's what we have to learn. Not always easy, but it takes maturity to get past that, that those hurts and disappointments that we can so easily feel. So then he said, knowing this, that the trying of your faith, faith works what? Patience. patience. You have to have patience. And patience possess you your what? Soul. Your soul. All right. And so if Abraham and Sarah had what? Patience. God still, you got to have patience. All right. And we talked about that on last week. And then he said, and if you don't understand this aspect about having joy and temptation with patience, that means you must lack wisdom is what he was trying to say. So then he said, if any man lack what? Wisdom, let him ask of God. You got to ask God. God, I don't seem to know how to do this. Because when this happened, this happened, I get mm -hmm. teed up. I get upset. So obviously, I ain't got it right. So now I need you to give me wisdom on how to do it properly. Because difficulties and temptations and problems in life are going to happen. You are not going to get away from those things. They're going to be part of what you do as living in this world. You're going to have issues. So we're going to need what? Wisdom to get over it. And then we talked about how not only do you have to have the wisdom, but then you got to have faith because you, your faith is what he says here. But let, uh, let him ask. He says, if you don't have wisdom, you just do what? Ask of God who gives to every man liberally. But when you ask him for the wisdom to understand your difficulties, ask, let him ask in faith, nothing what? Wavering. All right, so you got to put your faith in it. So you got to be confident that God's got it under control. No matter how many stones hit you upside the head, God's got it under control. 
I'm still going to do what I got to do. I'm still going to look at God. I'm still going to look for direction. But I'm going to still have my focus on the Lord. And this world is easily able to get you to go a different way. And what James points out in the 8th verse, he says that you cannot allow yourself to be, what, double-minded. You've got to make sure that you are established in the ways of the Lord. Because a double-minded man, he says, is what? Unstable. All right. And then he talked about the, uh, those that are rich. He said, don't think that just because you're rich, that you got it made, that you, you are it. Because the rich are not always going to be rich. You got to recognize and be, be, be joyful that the fact that you know the Lord because you know your riches in this world will easily pass. But he also said that the brother of low degree, let him rejoice because you're not always going to be struggling. Your eternal uh, reality is going to be even greater. All right. And uh, verse 11, he said, for the, the sun no sooner rises uh, with the burning of the heat, but it withers uh, the grass and the flower thereof falleth, and, and the grace of it, of the fashion of it perishing. So shall the rich fade away in his way. So riches are only for what? For this time. And it's trying to get us to realize. So what, and why is he bringing that out? Because a lot of times when you go through difficulty, what that means is that you may lose stuff. And, and sometimes your frustration and your anger come out, well, what I, look at what I just lost. But Jesus, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit is saying through James, hold on a second. Don't worry about whether you lose something. And if you happen to gain stuff, don't get all puffed up. Talk about, oh, I know I'm, because people do that today. I know I'm serving God right now. Look at how, look at all I got. No, you should be, you should, you should bring yourself to a, a humble state that, that I don't deserve anything, but God's grace gives it to me. You know, we got to, and then when you go through and you lose stuff, you got to be like, well, you know what? I may have lost some finances or some, 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 some you know, a job or whatever the case may be, but, but I still have the Lord and God knows what's going on. And I'm not going to waver in my focus and my trust on, on the Lord. James is telling you, <laughs> he's like, I don't expect you guys to lose faith just because you got some temptation going on. That's, that's what he's saying. I expect you guys to stand strong. Don't be folding and, and throwing in the towel just because difficulties happen. I want you to step up and do the right thing. James is talking, he's saying it just like it is. All right? And then he said, uh, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Well, he's going to have a, what? a crown of life. Let no man, when he is tempted, in verse 13, uh, say that uh, I am tempted of God. For God cannot tempt, cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempt he any man. So he's saying your temptations and your frustrations do not come from God. But he said in verse 14, which is a very important verse. He said, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away. By his own lust and then enticed. So you cannot be tempted by something that you don't in your own core desire. How many people can tempt you with a, with a, with a salad of rocks to eat? I'm going to pour some good, some good salad dressing on this. And, and you look at that. You ain't even thinking about it. I mean, that ain't even. Cause why? Because we don't eat rocks. There's nothing in our body the makeup in our design that desires rocks. I don't care what they put on it. You can put steak sauce, you put, we, I don't want no rocks because I don't eat rocks. And so you say, well, that's an absurd analogy because that's not something anybody would think about. Exactly. And so therefore you can never really be tempted by that. Mm -hmm. But you can be tempted by things that you do see as something that you might desire and want. And so that's why James is saying, you think it's God's bringing difficulty? Everything that you got that's a problem is because you desired it. You were tempted for it. You wanted to have that. That's how the devil works, and that's what he's trying to show. He's showing us the mystery of iniquity. He's showing us how the enemy works. He's letting us know that we don't have to be ignorant of the devil's devices. What happens is he knows your makeup. I know what you like. I know what you like. And that's, that's how all of this stuff, con men, 
these people they come in, they try to get your confidence, and then they tempt you because they know that people in general try to get something for nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, you do this, you do this, you come in here, you take your your your, your two thousand dollars. When it's all said and done, you can have four thousand mm dollars, -hmm. and they 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 know that you want that. I want my two thousand dollars to be turned into what four thousand. Man, I really want that. In, in, in just a month's time, oh, I want that to happen. Well, what happened? Your own what? Lust. Lust. Has now drawn you into this thing. And now the con man's got you. Because the thing he's got to get you to do, though, is to trust him more. You, you got you to gotta, you gotta want that, that, uh, that lust for that, the buildup of that finance override your ability to be suspicious about this individual. So when you should be suspicious, your greed does what? Overrides it. It cancels it. All right? Everybody is tempted like that. All right? So um, it's important that we keep that in mind. We, we have to let people know. And it's, it's something that's difficult. We got to let our, our young folks know. They say, like, well, I'm not going to do nothing. I'm not going to do that. No, it. It's you going to be what? Overriding. Right by your own personal desire. You, in your mind, you don't, you don't plan on doing it, but you're going to be what? Alright. Because that's just, it's in your nature. Alright? And, and we could go on and on about that. You know? I mean, how many times have I, I, I've sat down and I, I'm like, ooh, man, I'm, this is good. We, we get down for Thanksgiving dinner, and you're like, alright, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have this and this and this, we're going to get up. And what happened? I get overrided. I think I want some of that too. I'm gonna have it. I need some seconds. What? Not. That's a minor thing, but you can see how it works. You see. Now, to some people, these people that you know, I was watching this one show. This guy, he's like eight, nine hundred pounds. Now, that's a life and death situation for him now. All right. But everything. I mean, like talking about with this person across the street. You know. So now you got the situation with drugs. All right. Well, drugs give you that little temporary what? High. But then it also like throws you to the ground. It crushes you afterwards. And people have to recognize that. And then there's also a lot of peer pressure and, and people who you're around and all that stuff. It what? Overrides your sensibility to know how to do. And it all comes from your own what? Desires. Every man, the Bible said, James said, every man is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust. It says, and then when lust has uh, conceived, it brings forth what? Yeah. It brings forth sin. And then when sin is finished, it brings forth what? Yeah. Death. Mm. All right. So your own lust will do what eventually? Kill. Kill you. That's why we have to check it. That's why we have to be governed. That's why we have to have wisdom. We need advice. We need uh, structure. Uh, and James is trying to let, let you... But if you don't get this under control, eventually it will kill you. Mm. All right? The wages of sin is death. And if you go by your own lust, look at verse 16. He says, do not error, my brother. All right, now, he's about to tell you something. He says, when he says, do not error, he's letting you know, I'm going to tell you something that I think you got confused. I think your thinking on something is a little bit confused, and I don't want you to stay confused. So I want to let you know, I don't want you to be thinking like this. Or I don't want you to have wrong thinking. Or do not err in your ways or thinking. Do not err, my brother. Look at verse 17. Every good gift and every what? Perfect gift is from where? Above. And cometh down from the Father of lights. Alright, let's go back. Go back to 14. But every Man is tempted when he is drawn away of his what? Own mm -hmm. own lust, right? So, the every situation that you get yourself in, where does that come from? From your own, from your own lust. But when, when you are able to override that and you find that, these, that God opens up and gives you these good and perfect gifts, where do they come from? They come from God. Okay, comes from from Father Light. So you say, so that must mean then. This is how people get error. That must mean that when anything good happens, it comes from God. That's true. But now you got to define good, because 
Stevens got what? Stoned. Mm -hmm. But while he was being stoned, he also was still doing what? He was preaching. He was telling people what happened. Now, how do you define that from God's perspective? God was standing up looking at him, watching the stones hitting him. But God, obviously, based on, you didn't see Stevens on the record going, ouch, I see the son of, ouch, I see God, ouch. You didn't see him saying that because obviously the stones were hitting him when he was seeing the what? The vision. But what do you hear him saying? He see, you see him talking clear. And I think his body was, was being red with the stones. But, but at the same time, what did God do? Obviously, he must have somehow or another alleviated the issue of the hurt and allowed Stevens to have a good experience. So see, definition of what good is. Now, what we have done, we have turned good into, well, when you're prosperous, when you got extra money, when you can fly from where you want, when you have your own jet, when you got your own Mercedes, you got your own house on the hill. Those are, that's good. And they, and they have defined that that's how you know God's on your side. That's how you know. And th that is not what James is talking about here. Because what these people are doing, they are actually going after their own what? Their own lust. They're chasing their lust and they don't recognize it. They confuse it. They got it twisted. And that's why James is saying, <laughs> don't error my brother. Every good and perfect gift come down from the Father of lights. Who is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God will not turn. He wants the best for you. And that's the key. That's how you know it's good. He wants the best for you. And sometimes the best for you is discipline. Sometimes the best for you is going through. Um, there's a um, story about these 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 moths, and I forget the name of it, so I'm sorry, but I did. I'm going through the commentary, and I was like, well, that's a good example, but I forgot the name of the moth. But but, but these moths are huge; they're big moths, and um, but their cocoon that they do, that they you know when they transfer them do they, they metamorphosis from uh, the caterpillar to the moth, it's very tiny. And so you look at it and you go, how did this, this big moth come out of such a, a, a small cocoon? And it takes them an enormous amount of time comparatively to other moths to come out of the cocoon. Oh, one of those channels, yeah. And they, they struggle to come out. And it takes a lot of effort to get them to come out. And this one... Um, uh, uh, what do you call the people that, that study animals, but the animal study person? <laughs> um, he was looking at that, and he decided to help the the the, the, the moth, and he and because he was struck, and he, so he cut the end of the cocoon out so he can come out quicker, and he did come out quicker. But what happened was that moth never could ne never could fly, ended up dying early. And then what he learned later was that <clears throat> the struggle for him to come out of the cocoon, the difficulty in this, actually was forcing uh, the blood to go into uh, uh, er uh, greater areas of the wing where it would not go naturally. It just, I mean, gravity just wouldn't pull it there. You needed pressure. You needed some, some pressure to force the blood to go into those areas of the, of the wing because those areas of the wing were so compressed and they had no blood in it. That's why it was so tiny. But putting the blood in it allowed it to enlarge a little bit, a little bit, and that's how he got to be such a big. But if he didn't go through the struggle of coming out that very tight cocoon, the blood would never be pressurized and be forced into those areas of the wing. So his struggle is what gave him his glorious life. And so when you look at that, it's a lot like how sometimes we have to look. We, God, why do I have to struggle? Why do I have to go through this? Why do I have to have these difficulties? Because there are things that God wants you to be able to do, and you're going to have to go through the struggle and the difficultiness, the difficult, the hard times. I ain't got my words together today. <laughs> but thank God for variety. I can find another word. Right? You got to go through the, the hard times that will allow you to fly at a later time. But if you never go through that hard time coming out, how you, wouldn't, you may not be able to fly 
in the in the in, in the in the future. You know, it may take away your ability to really do well uh, as life goes on. And so sometimes it's hard for us to understand the value of difficult days, which is why James is telling them, don't get it twisted. Don't think just because it's a difficult day that God is not on our side. He is. He's allowing us to grow. He's strengthening us. He's strengthening you. The word is going forth. Uh, people are going into other lands and they're talking to, about Jesus into places they never heard about. God is allowing you to really just strengthen your wings and you are being able to actually be a greater force for the kingdom of God. But that only happens when you go through some difficulties. All right? And so he's saying that every good and perfect gift comes down, come, comes from above. All right. Look at eighteen. Of our of his own will uh, begat he us of, of of his own will begat he us with the word of what truth of and this is the of his own will. That means God wanted us. It was His will. Of His will He begotten us. All right, and so. Uh, we are born uh, uh, in sin and shaped iniquity, but then we now have the opportunity to be what? Born what? Again. This is what Jesus told Nicodemus. Marvel not. I say unto you, you must be what? Born again. And so we're born of his own, of his own uh, uh, will. He says, of his own will begat he us through the what? Word of truth. So that means we got uh, scripture but what kind of scripture true scripture true. All right. the word of truth God's word God's word is true All right. and so when you hear whosoever will let him what let him come that's God's word when, when they say uh, uh, they, you believe on the Lord Jesus and you shall be saved that is what that is true, true. That we should be a kind of first fruits of his creation. So we are a kind of first fruits. We are an example of, James is saying, we gonna, we're an example of, of many that are to come. People that go through difficulties and troubles and learn to trust in God and become uh, children of God. Because we're kind of like a first fruit. And, they were gonna, and then what that means is there's going to be many to come after us that are dealing with the similar stuff. Right. And so uh, he's encouraging them, you know, you're going to be kind of a first fruit. And one of the good things about being a first fruit is you can set good examples. You can set forth patterns. Right? Um, we can get in the plane now and go to California. <laughs> right? But now you go back to <laughs> you go back to the 1600s or 1700s or 1800s. To get to California, you had to do what? You had to use your feet, or you got on a you got on a horse. You got in one of them what them, them horse-driven carriages. You were not moving at 600 miles an hour, but somebody had to be the first what trailblazer. Somebody had to do what set the way. Somebody had to show which is the best way to get down there. Don't go that way because you're gonna have to go through those rocks, through the Rocky Mountains, and you know, let's go this go the southern route, and you get down there. You need that first person, all right, to get. And so, being a kind of first fruit is important, all right. Uh, eight, Nineteen. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to what hear, and slow to what slow to wrath, all right. So, um, you kind of look at it from the standpoint. How many ears have we got? How many? How many mouths? So you should be listening twice as much as you speak. That's why I said a little children. <laughs> <laughs> listening is a key part of anything. Hearing. That's why um, if you, uh, it, when the scripture says, if you, uh, he that hath an ear to hear, let him what? Hear. hear. It never really says he that has eyes to look or nose to smell. Something about hearing. 
listening with your ears. If you have an ear to hear. And so um, we should be um, swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. All right. And that's important because um, when you're hearing something, you need to take a moment and, and get what? Understanding. A lot of people will hear something, but they can repeat what you heard, but don't what? Don't apply it. And they don't apply it because what? They don't, they don't understand it. So, I mean, a parrot can repeat what you say, but a parrot has no idea. He's just, so our goal when we hear is to do what? Process the information. Make sure we understand. And if you don't understand, you do what? You ask. You ask. All right? And you get yourself wisdom. All right? And then um, a lot of times because we don't do that, because we don't allow ourselves to be swift to hear and we don't be slow to speak, we end up in what? Wrath. Whereas James is saying, be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For, 20, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Now, I don't know if I can say that in the plenty. James, like I said, James don't pull no punches. James, the wrath of man, your wrath, does not work the righteousness of God. You getting the attitude and getting upset and, and taking things in your own hand, don't solve the problem. Remember when Jesus was in the garden? Uh, uh, and, and he was praying and then at, at a certain point he told him okay this is it our time is now here and the soldiers came mm -hmm. and when they went to go grab uh, to, to Jesus what did Peter do out he took out his sword and what did the he sliced the man's ear and Jesus said put your sword away if you live by the sword you will what perish. you'll perish by the sword he had quick wrath Not, but he never understood because he wasn't listening. Jesus had told him time and time again, I am going to be captured. I am going to be arrested. I am going to be put to death. And he was saying it over and over and over again, but they weren't what? They weren't hearing it. And they did not understand it. All right, but um, it's important that we have an ability to listen and to hear and to put forth proper uh, understanding and, and knowing that our wrath can never equal or be equated to the righteousness of God. Where do we get our righteousness from? <coughs> Bless you. We get our righteousness from God. It's imputed unto us because in us there is no righteousness. The Bible says our best, our best righteousness is what? Filthy, Filthy rags. And uh, that ain't something that's appealing to, to, uh, to the Lord. So we are imputed with righteousness. We're given. All right, 21. Wherefore lay apart all, how much? All filthiness. All right. So I mean, you could just go to gamut. What is, what is filthy in this world? All right. And what James is saying: lay aside all that stuff. Lay aside all filthiness and super superfluity of naughtiness. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> superfluity. You know. I was listening to a lot of commentators explain this, but I think the best way to explain this is kind of like a visual definition. Because it just means all kinds of naughtiness, it just finds every nook and cranny. You can kind of look at, when you spill water on something, what does water do? Water looks for the lowest place it can go, and that's the way it's going to go. And that's what superfluity of naughtiness. It's like, I want to look for the lowest degree of character, the lowest degree of, of, of purity and that's where I'm going to drift to. I'm fluid. I'm just going to go. So where, if you go to a town wherever they got the, the whatever the worst people hang out at, guess what? That's where you're going to find me. Because what? I got superfluity of naughtiness. I always seem to drift and to gravitate towards what? The what? The, the issues or whatever that town or city may have that's where I end up. And there are people, unfortunately, like that. You know, they, they always look for, you know, and, and, and sometimes it ain't so much for the town. Sometimes when you go into a, a situation where, you know, there was, there was something happening and there's some money missing. Well, 
there's some people that just can't they, they when there's an opportunity to take advantage of something and, and do be a little dishonest they just they just they see the opportunity and they just they just flow right on into it just like water f finding the lowest point it can get to the gravity just pulls it to the lowest point people are some people are like that I'm gonna find the the, the most Dirt, super, the most naughtiness. And this is what James said. He says, <laughs> I love this phrase he uses. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Lay it all aside. And receive with meekness the engrafted what? Word. Which is what we're studying now. Right? Because, see, that superfluity of naughtiness is once again tied to what he said how every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his what? Own lust. lust. We, we can't help ourselves which is why we need the word of God. Which is why James is saying I don't want you to be, to, to be uh, 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 filthy. I don't want you to have that superfluity of naughtiness. But if you try to do it on your own guess what's going to happen? You're still going to drift. You may not drift as fast as other people but you're still drifting. The only way to stop your drifting from happening is you got to get into the what? The Word. You need God to help you. You need the words of God. Otherwise, you will drift. Now, there's some people, they don't drift. They run to the issues. Other people, they kind of drift. You know, they, they, got, you know they, they, they hesitate a little bit, but they end up in the same place. All right? So we got to focus on making sure that we have that engrafted word which is able to save your what soul. your soul all right 22 but be ye doers of the word and not what hear is only all right that's part of the understanding so he told us to hear right be swiftly what hear. hear but then don't just hear it get an understanding and then be able to do what apply it you got to be able to do it all right and look what he says. Be, but be ye not do, uh, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. See, a hearer that does not just like, okay, I want to, I want to teach you how to repair brakes on the car, and you come to the class. Gentlemen, give you a class on how to repair brakes on the car, and you sit there and you listen to everything, and they go, okay. What do you got to do? What is this called? It's called the drum. What is it called? It's called the drum. You repeat everything he said. And then you sit there and you watch him repair the things. And he does it for a whole week. He takes the brakes out. Removes the old ones. Puts the new ones on. Does it for a whole week. And then you come back. Okay, now it's your turn to do it. I don't know how to do it. You listened. You heard. But you never really grasped a what? An understanding. You never envision and visualize yourself doing. <coughs> Put yourself in that situation. All right? And that means you're doing what? You heard, you hear, but you are not what? A doer. You got to be able to put yourself in the situation. You got to try to imagine yourself doing it. Imagine yourself being able to accomplish these things. Uh, and then when it's your turn to do it, you have an idea as to how to do it. You have to have that that understanding that I can do this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All right? So don't deceive yourself just because you said, well, I sat and heard. Sitting and hearing don't mean nothing if you don't get what? Understanding. All right? So he says that if you do that, you are what? Deceiving your own self. Look at verse 23. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass uh, for he beholds himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was alright so what is he saying he's saying that you the minute you walk away everything that you observe by looking at yourself in the mirror you what it's gone when you look yourself in the mirror and you see that Okay, I got some. Still got some sleep in my eye. I got some. I got some. Uh, some, 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 some something wrong with my nose. I got some crust on my on the side of my mouth. 
When you look in the mirror and you see all that in the morning, what do you do? You're supposed to do what? You're supposed to wash your face, right? Mm -hmm. But if you look yourself in the mirror, and the minute you turn away from the mirror, you think, I'm good. I'm good to go. And just walk on out. You saw information, and you received information about yourself, but the minute the information stopped showing itself to you, you forgot all about it. And James is saying, this is how a lot of people are. They see themselves in a, uh, uh, in a glass. Now, the thing about it is, he's using this mirror aspect, this glass, because that's what the law is. The law is something that tells you what you're wrong. You know, the law says, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt uh, honor thy mother and thy father, thou shalt... You know, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. That's what the law is telling you. And when the Lord tells you that, it's showing you an image of how things are supposed to be. But then, um, if you turn away and go, I'm good, I don't need to do nothing, you're deceiving your own self. When you see yourself in the mirror of the law, you should say, I need help. And you st there's a lot of times what people do, they start trying to scrub their own self. You know, They start doing their own little works. And a lot of cults are like that. A lot of cults are work oriented. They're out there, you know, you can see that you know, they're doing some Jehovah's Witnesses. They're out there putting hours and hours and hours of work in to earn their way into the, uh, the afterlife. Um, all the Muslims, you know, they got the whole garb and their, their whole thing is, you know, they got to wear the turban, they got to have the beard and, and, the, and the special clothes and the prayers, you know, in a certain way at certain times, all these rituals. And even Jesus pointed that out because he said that the Pharisees of his day, he goes, they like to stand in the marketplace and wear the, 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 the long borders on their garments and have people, you know, say rabbi, you know, this and say long prayers. And he goes, he goes you know, that, that ain't it. He, he said, you know, you should not be like that. Don't you be like how they are. And so we get it sometimes uh, confused when we see certain things and we, and we just move on. The word, though, look what he says. Let's finish this up. Let's, let's connect it to it. All right. For if, if, uh, go back, I'm going to go back up to 23. I'm just going to keep reading down, and then we'll go back, and, and we'll connect all this, and then we'll be done. All right. Verse 23. It, for if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For... He beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. He forgot he needed to do what? Wash his face. 25. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of what? Liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a what? Forgetful hearer. But a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. All right. So what is he saying? When you're looking into the into the mirror, and we already said that the the the, the Old Testament, the law, all the prophets, those those were like mirrors to us to show us we got issues. We got real issues. Um, thou, thou shalt not uh, uh, steal. And then Jesus came back and, and refined it. He said, you know, he says, thou shalt not kill. He says, but I say unto you that you should, that if you hate your brother without, without a cause, you know, that, uh, that you are already guilty. And so he went forth and showed us that all of these things, and so now when we look at these, all the stuff in the Old Testament, all the rituals and all of the, the festivals, and all of the activities that they had to do, the killing of the, the turtle doves and of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the sheep and the goats and the, all those rituals that you had to do perfectly. And if you did one thing wrong, guess what? You were guilty. So then the law is telling you, you got a dirty face. The law, you're looking in the law of God, you're looking in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, when you finish reading, you're just going to say, I got a dirty face. Not so much a dirty face, but my whole, my what? My, my being. I am dead in sin. I am covered in sin. So then <clears throat> we need to say, well, I need to find a way to get this sin off of me. And how do we get it? 
He goes, through Jesus Christ. All right? Washed in the what? Blood of the Lamb. And that washes away our sin. All right? And so, but if we look at ourselves and say, I'm fine. I don't need Jesus. All right? Even though you may, you, you hear it. And so there are some people that say, well, I like Jesus. And I like Jesus for, for what Jesus says, you know, um, asking you shall receive. I like that part of Jesus. I like that part of Jesus that says, uh, uh, well, you, if you come unto me and, and I, I'll heal you, you know, uh, touch my garment and you'll, 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 you'll be healed. I like that part. But what about making him your Lord and understanding that you have no righteousness and you need his righteousness? And to me, it's a very simple aspect of just acknowledging that. That's all it is. But the word, this is what the word tells us. But a lot of people don't want to do that because if you make him your Lord, guess what? You got to do what he is giving you to do. So you may have to walk the walk like a Stephen's. You may have to walk the walk like a John the Baptist. Some people say, I ain't. I, if I got to walk that walk, I ain't following him. Well, guess what? You won't, you'll never follow him. I want to walk the walk like Solomon. I want to have all the money and all the... That might not be your walk. See, if you follow Jesus, you say, I'm, okay, I'm following you, Lord. And the Lord says, okay. This is the way you're going to have to go through. And you're going to have some issues. Paul, he, 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 when God told him what he was going to have to do, Paul went to God and prayed, said, God, take this, this, this thorn in the side away from me. And God said, my grace is sufficient for you. So Paul's like, well, fine. I'm, I'm just going to follow. I'm not going to you know, try to counteract that. I'm just going to follow. So a lot of what we're trying to do and what James is doing, and, and, and we're really trying to get us to see this, and James is starting off, you are having issues, and I know you are. He's talking to, the, to that church in, 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 uh, in Jerusalem. You are having issues. You are being persecuted. But you still got to stand up. You can't fold. You can't cry to them out, well, these people don't like me. <laughs> and you see that today. You, you watch some of these TV shows today. Now, some of them don't like me. <laughs> Can you imagine them being way back at the time of James? I'm like, uh, uh, my friends don't like me. James be like, please. Right? And sometimes we got to get over that. So and so don't like me. So, persecution is going to happen. And, and Jesus said, if they persecute me, guess what's going to happen to you? So we're going to have difficulty. We're going to have some uncomfortable situations. All right, let's finish this up. Uh, 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue but deceives his own heart this man's religion is what is vain all right so this man he seems to be so what james is saying now and this is what we kind of point out there's a lot of people that look like they are following the lord all right but you got to listen to what they what say because the, the words of God won't come off their tongue. They'll say things as they, they, they are not going to say the things that the Spirit will, will say. They're going to say what? Their tongues are not bridled. All right? They're not owned by the, by the Lord. And bridled not his tongue, but deceives his own heart. And that's the sad part. He allowed himself to be what? Deceived. This man's religion is in vain. And it didn't say it didn't even say this man's salvation because this man doesn't have what. Salvation. What does he have? He has religion. religion. That's all he's got. And there's a lot of people. That's all they got. They got religion. That's all the Muslims got. All their activities that they do. All the stuff that they and all the good. Religion is not a bad thing. But religion is not salvation. It's not salvation. There's a lot of good religion. Some of these, these uh, different religious groups try to do a lot of good things. Uh, but that don't mean that that's salvation. Um, and that's the part we have to also keep in mind. So he goes, in 27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this. Now, he's telling you what pure religion is. He didn't say this was what? 
religion. salvation. Yes. He said this is pure religion. So if you want to know how to really be right and, and allow your salvation to be practiced, which is what religion is, practicing what you believe, to be practiced properly, this is what you should be doing. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless. So what is he saying? You go help somebody that has no, what? Guidance. He didn't say give money to the father. He said visit him. Why? Because a person that has no father has no what? 